for the reading of God's Word this morning, we're turning to Psalm 1. And I hope that you will stay for the second service uh, because we'll be looking at Psalm 2. They truly work together. But for now, we're reading Psalm 1. Hear the Word of God. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God shall stand forever. Let us pray. Father, since our whole salvation depends on a proper understanding and hearing of your word, we ask that by your spirit you will lead and guide and, and help us to understand your word to us so that we may love it and cherish it and serve you all the days of our life. Through Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Please be seated. Paul tells us that our goal in the Christian life is that we would reach unity in faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And we do that, of course, by faith. And the chief exercise of, pray, of faith is prayer. That's how we receive the benefits of Christ's redemption, and that's how we will grow in our maturity. The problem is we don't always know how to pray. We're like the disciples, Lord, teach us to pray. Or as Paul writes in Romans, likewise the Spirit helps in our weakness because we don't know how to pray. And so we're called to be a people of prayer. We're called to mature and grow in our faith, and the way we do that is often through prayer. And God has given us this book of Psalms to teach us how to pray. In fact, Augustine called the Psalms a school. Ambrose called the Psalms a gymnasium where you go and work out. Athanasius said, quote, all of the divine scriptures teach virtue and the true faith, but the book of Psalms contains in a special way the pattern of, for life of the soul, end quote. And of course, Luther said that the Psalms were like a compendium, a, a little Bible, he called it. So the Psalms have tremendous value for us as, of course, all of Scripture, but in such a unique way. And I'd like to focus this morning and think with you about Psalm 1 and 2 and how together they form an introduction into this book of Psalms. They open up the subject matter, not only of the Psalms as a whole, but particularly that first book of Psalms, which is uh, book Psalm 3 through 41. I'd like to note three things this morning. First of all, the, the joy that we are to find in meditating on God's law. I'd like to, secondly, look at who is able to do that. And then thirdly, what are some things that Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 do to shape our prayer life? The psalm begins with an amazing word, blessed. Blessed sets the tone. Happy, joyful. It's as if the psalmist knows that we're not ready to pray when we think about we, we, that we might be, that we need something to grab our attention because we're distracted. 
or we're listless in our Christian life, or we're apprehensive about approaching God. Blessed arouses expectation. It says something is there for you. It's like a directional antenna. It picks up signals and tells us that something is here, something wonderful. We may not know exactly what's being offered when we first read Psalm 1, but if it's true, it's telling us that we can find something that we have been longing for our whole life, something that will make us more of what we were created to be. How joyful is this person? Joy. Isn't, isn't that what we're all after? The French mathematician and philosopher Blaise Pascal said this about joy, and of course when he's thinking about joy, he uses the word happiness, but for him that's joy. He said, all men seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end. The cause of some going to war and others avoiding it is the same desire in both attended with different views. The will never takes the least step but to this object. This is the motive of every action of every man, even those who hang themselves. Happiness is what we're all after. And Psalm 1 begins saying, here it is. This is the way to happiness. And it explains further in verse 1, that man is blessed who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. So interestingly, the psalmist begins with uh, a negative. It's, it's like somebody asking you a question, and you say, well, it's not this, and it's not this, and it's not this, but this is what it is. And that's the way the psalmist begins his explanation of a blessed life. It's not being with the counsel of the wicked or standing in the way of sinners nor sitting in the seat of scoffers. It's not walking by the advice of the wicked. Worse than that, it's not standing in the path of moral failures, which implies more than just having done something. It means that you're actually standing firm in it. You're no longer walking in it. You're standing firm in it. And then finally, it's not sitting with scoffers. It's not merely living a certain way of life, but also taking part in their deliberations as well. And so we will see these wicked all throughout the Psalms, the scorners and the mockers. They might be given different names. They might be called enemies or godless, whatever it might be, but we will see them all throughout the Psalms. These are people who know what they think and do not want anyone telling them otherwise. They don't want God's law. They don't want God's word to tell them what to do. And the psalmist says, that's not where blessing is to be found. The psalmist explains, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on that law he meditates day and night. The law of the Lord, of course, is a very general term here, referring to God's teaching, God's instruction, God's word. When you and I come to see the scriptures as God's word, God speaking to us, it causes delight. It speaks to us in ways unlike anything else does. All God's word has that characteristic. God's word is not some reference book that you can go into your own personal library and say, well, I'm kind of struggling with an issue or I'd like to know a little bit more about what people believed in ancient times and you grab the Bible off the shelf and you open it up. That's not God's word. God's word has this characteristic about it that it speaks directly and personally and intently to each one of us. There's nothing bookish about the words of God that are in his scripture. God's word hits us where we live. And the book of 
Hebrews puts it so well, for the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God's word, his law, is intensely personal in nature. It can pierce and penetrate our heart. And that's why it brings delight. We can see even more about God's law if we just kind of take a little excursion here and look at Psalm 19 and Psalm 119 as well. In Psalm 19, the first half of that psalm talks about God's creation and how everything fits together. God created it good and beautiful. And the second half of Psalm 19 talks about his word, his law. And the whole point is to say, when we find our place in God's word, when we, when we see ourselves and we, we know God's word speaks to us, we find our place in creation. When we hear and we obey his instruction, we find our place in his good creation. When we meditate on his law, we don't become less human. We actually become more human, more of what we were created for. Psalm 19. That's why Psalm 19.7 puts it so well. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. You see, it has that ability to revive our souls. And then we look, secondly, at Psalm 119. Psalm 119, of course, is a longer psalm made up of 22 stanzas, each taking a letter from the Hebrew alphabet, going through it. It's as if the psalm is saying, here is God's word, and it covers everything in our lives from A to Z. It's all there. It's comprehensive. It's all-encompassing. It applies to everything in our life, not just the religious aspects. The moment we know this about God's law, that it is speaking to us and providing guidance, not just for us personally, but for all of creation. When we know this, it brings delight. We take pleasure in it and delight in meditating upon it. That word meditate is the key verb here in this psalm. Meditate on God's law. What does that mean? You know, the word meditate does not appear very often in the Old Testament. There is one place where it appears, and you wouldn't know it by the context or the translation. In Isaiah 31, 4, it talks about, as a lion or a young lion growls over its prey. Do you see that picture? There's a lion, and it's got prey, and it's about to consume it, and it's enjoying it, and it's growling. That word for growl is the same word used here for meditate. So there's this sense of joyfulness of, of wanting to consume what it has in front of it. It's a bodily action. It involves the speaking of the words, not just, not just reading them, but actually speaking them. In fact, that's what most Christians did for, for hundreds of years, that the scriptures, when they would read them, would read them aloud. They wanted their mouths to speak them. They wanted to hear them with their ears. And oftentimes they were reading in groups of people. And so meditating, we think of as you're sitting in a closet, quietly reading. But many, many Christians would read aloud and they would read to others. And they enjoyed the sounds of the words. In fact, here's an example from ancient history. Virgil, who is one of the, the great Roman poets, you, you've heard of his name before, in writing the Ecologues, he introduces this shepherd boy, and he's talking about the shepherd boy, and he's practicing. He's, it says he's meditating on his flute. That's an odd way to put it. Have you ever meditated on a flute before? He's rehearsing it. He's practicing it. He's playing it. There, there's a physical activity involved. That's the idea behind meditation, that people were, their whole bodies were involved in it. They're, they were speaking it. They were hearing it. They were rejoicing in it. Well, 
I'm not saying you shouldn't read your Bible quietly by yourself. You should continue to do that. But if there's opportunities for you to speak it out loud, I think that increases the joy. Well, what we do find from the psalm is that it says the wicked, the sinners, the scoffers, do not delight in God's teaching. They don't even recognize the scripture as God's word. But those who meditate on it find delight in it and are blessed by it. So if that's the key verb of the psalm, meditation, meditate upon it, the key image that the psalmist wants us to grab in our minds is tree. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Well, we know that, the, that in the Middle Eastern climate, the long, dry season comes when the fruit needs water the most. And therefore, it needs to be planted near some source of water so that the tree can send forth its roots and draw upon that water. A similar language is found, listen how closely this is even, Jeremiah 17, verse 8. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes. For it leaves, its leaves remain green, and it is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. End quote. The image of the tree claims our attention. It says, put your roots down here. It says, remember the people of God in the Old Testament, how they were taken into captivity and exile in Babylon. And they were brought to Babylon, this dry, arid desert place with only one river going through it. But the Babylonians had figured out irrigation, and so they developed these water channels. Even as some of you here in eastern Colorado, I've seen the irrigation, so I know you figured it out too. To draw upon rivers by creating channels of water. Well, that's what this translation is, is saying that we as trees need to be planted near a source of water so that our roots can branch out and draw upon the sustenance of life. These people of Israel were refugees in the worst possible place, and the Babylonians questioned them, can you sing us one of your songs now in this foreign land? But transplanted to Babylon by streams of living water, they were like trees. They put out leaves and they produced fruit. In all that that person does, they prosper because they're drawing upon the source of life, upon God himself, his word. His word, which created all things in the first place, continues to provide life and sustenance for all who will draw upon it. Well, how are the faithless not like the faithful? In the way things work out for them. But the difference is their destiny is very different. You see, in reading this psalm, we might think, okay, he's just said that the righteous person is like a tree and they find their sustenance, their, their source of life in God's law. And the wicked are not so. And so we might think in our minds, oh, he's going to say they're like shrubs. But he actually switches the metaphor here, doesn't he? He says they're like chaff. So it's harvest time. And, uh, and many of you know this, but maybe for younger people, you don't know this, that in, in old times, uh, they didn't have the threshing machines. And so what did they have? They would gather the grain in a pile and on a windy day, the farmer with the winnowing fork would throw it up in the air and the good grain would fall to the ground to be collected, later eaten. But the useless part, the chaff, would be blown away. Chaff is a standard image for something that's useless. It provides us a an image of the destiny of the faithless. That's exactly how they are like chaff. When judgment comes, 
the faithful, the wicked, will not be able, it says, to take their stand in the time of judgment. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. You see, the Lord has created a moral order to life. The Lord has built into life the fact that the wages of sin is death. And this psalm is merely saying there's two ways, right? We know this from Psalms and Proverbs. There are two ways in life. You follow the Lord, or you can follow your own devices. And each of them have their own ends. And it's just built into life that if you live and pursue a certain way of life, the end will be there for you. What's so unique about verse 6, it says the Lord knows the way of the righteous. That in fact, even in this created order, this moral order that God has created, that he knows personally his righteous. He knows them. Whereas the, the wicked, they're simply described as saying their way will lead to death. Well, that's who, that's the way of the, the joyful life. But who is able to partake of this life? See, many of us, and I include myself, have failed in loving the law of the Lord, in delighting in it. How often have we chosen not to meditate or delight in his instruction? That can be kind of depressing. Only Jesus becomes the blessed man who delights in the law perfectly in that instruction day and night. So without some kind of remedy for our situation, we are in dire straits. We will not be able to enjoy that delight. We will not be able to stand in the judgment. How can we be sinners who are able to stand in the congregation of the righteous. Well, my brothers and sisters, this is the good news this morning. Here is the gospel, and it comes to us from Paul's message to the Romans. And you know this, but I'm just reminding you of it. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace, listen to what he says, in which we stand. We are standing in grace by faith. And so we are able, with the righteousness of Jesus Christ, to stand and to delight in God's law and his word. Paul says in Romans, think about Abraham and David, and he says, even think, look at my own life. He says, there's a contrast between those who've pursued a life of works and a life of faith. And he says, Abraham and David, and now I are pursuing a life of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They were reckoned righteous because they looked away from themselves and they confessed their sins, and they trusted in the Lord for his forgiveness and grace. They looked to his righteousness to be reckoned righteous by him. And so Paul says in Romans, God put forward his son as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness. This is the good news. Jesus Christ is the righteousness of God. And when we place our trust in him, we are credited as righteous. And therefore, the Lord knows the way of the righteous. They are the ones who have looked away from themselves, who've humbled themselves and confessed and looked to him with the eyes of faith. And so as new creations in Jesus Christ, we can read Psalm 1. We can be people who delight in God's law because he has made us a new creation. He has given us his spirit whereby we are able to love his word. That's who's able. 
to enjoy the delight of God's word. And then finally, I want to ask the question, what do Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 now teach us about our prayer life? Psalm 1, and we're going to see later on in the second service, Psalm 2, form an introduction to the book of Psalms. They're kind of a preemptive strike. It's God's way of saying, look at all the Psalms in between, from Psalm 3 all the way to the end of the Psalter. There are, there's a lot of, there are a lot of Psalms with people in trouble. All kinds of trouble physical problems, emotional problems, even feeling, God, where are you? I feel that you have forsaken me. All kinds of prayers of expressions of hardship and pain are in the Psalter. But God wanted to put a, in a sense, a boundary around those Psalms to say, it doesn't always, it's not always that way. This is my intention for life, that you would delight in my word, that you would meditate on it day and night, that you would be like a tree that would be would be producing fruit. That's my desire for you. And that's that is offered for you. This is an encouragement for us to pursue that life. And then we go through the Psalms and we say, Yeah, but there are struggles too. And then we get to the end, and the end of the Psalter is praise. And so God has, in a sense, bounded the Psalter with joy and praise. And in the midst of all of that, yes, there's the tribulation and the hardship of our Christian life. And so we're invited in Psalm 1, blessed is the man, delight, tree-bearing fruit, it gives such a prominent place to prayer. Secondly, we are reminded that prayer is not the first word that we have. We don't get the first word with God, in other words, because God's already spoken. God's word, God's law, he's got the first word. Prayer becomes a response. All prayer is a response to God's activity, God's word, God's actions. In fact, one Old Testament scholar said prayer is answering speech. We're answering God. And so the Psalter assumes that we are not prepared to pray, and it grabs our attention and it tells us God has already spoken in his word. By his son, the word made flesh. Psalm 1 is this poetic affirmation of the fruitfulness of a lifestyle attuned to God's instruction. It's the most basic decision of how to live. And the po- the, this poem crafts an understanding of life in contrast as as a contrast in order to encourage us to live a fruitful life, a life of righteousness, rather than the barren way of the wicked. The psalmist is in essence asking us, to what is your life devoted to? What gives the most basic direction for living? The psalmist says it's God's word, his law, and he invites those readers to give attention to it and the instruction in the Psalms. The most basic decision to follow God's direction makes it possible for all of us to be rooted and grounded and fruitful. God has created a moral order to life. And the psalmist observes that meditation upon his instruction brings the possibility for full living. To be happy in the Lord is to have a solid foundation, a place to stand. And those of you who trust in Jesus Christ, you are standing on a firm foundation, and you will stand in the day of judgment. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word, which is an encouragement to us. It's a light and a lamp 
in a very dark world. We ask that you will continue to build in us this desire to put our roots down and to meditate upon your word and to find delight in it, to just speak the words and to hear them over and over again and to rejoice in what you have done in your creation and in your salvation of your people. We thank you, O oh God, for this word, for this encouragement to pursue a life of blessedness. Help us to do that by your grace. Through Christ we pray. Amen.